University of Vermont Extension and the Vermont Agricultural Experiment Station present the nation's longest running farm, home, and community program, Across the Fence. Your host is Tony Adams. And today on Across the Fence, we're going to highlight the poetry of George Albert Letty, and many of his poems are contained in this book that is self-published by his grandson. He is Chris A. Bear from Colchester, Vermont, who will be reciting a couple of his grandfather's poems. Chris, first, give us a background on your grandfather, George Letty. Well, he was born in a logging camp on land that's where the uh, firing range is in Underhill. It's no longer there, but he was part of the Letty clan that came out of the Irish settlement up there. And he moved to Burlington and worked in the mills and had an ice cream shop on Church Street. And he worked for some of the ice cream companies like Seal Test and ended up working for the Strong Hardware Store. Mm -hmm. But uh, poetry was just a hobby for him. And he lived in one per what period? He was born in 1883. 1883 and died when? In 1967. Mm -hmm. How is your grandfather related to uh, the namesake of Letty Park here in Burlington? Yeah, I'm often asked that. And they came from the same clan. And Bernard Letty, who the park is named after, who was uh, a once Democratic candidate for governor, uh, was my grandfather's first cousin once removed. Mm -hmm. And he. Uh, of course, was a judge, wasn't he? Judge Letty, yeah. Judge Letty. Well, working on the book of poems, you realize there were more than poems that they were uh, best appreciated when heard and not just read, right? Right, exactly. And, that, and that's when I really understood it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were in the family for years and these old manuscripts that he left behind, and we would read them, and they were enjoyable. But I think the real value of the poetry is to be recited and to be heard. You said you had manuscripts. Who were they left to? Well, they were, my mother was, uh, Mary was his only daughter. So they were in the family and they came down to us nine kids that my mother had and I sought to preserve them by making photocopies for everybody in the family. And that's sort of how I got started on this project. Okay, well now we're going to begin by asking you to recite the old picket fence, uh, it's something we can all relate to as we get older, so let's listen. Tear down the old picket fence, you say? No, I think I'll let it stay. I'll patch it up and paint it white. I guess I'll make it look all right. You see, that old fence means to me a whole lot more than you can see. It speaks to me of things I knew when fields were green and skies were blue. It speaks to me a long ago, and yet it seems but yesterday. Just Ma and me and little Joe, our little Joe just turning three. He had to have a place to play where he'd be safe and wouldn't stray. And so I built that fence for him, a sort of place to keep him in. And in the spring, a tiny shoot peeped from the earth to seek the sun. It seemed to know the picket fence would make a place for vines to run. Then o'er the fence so white and clean, it spread a wealth of verdant green. It seemed to know it held the grace to help to beautify the place. Then very soon in brilliant hue, violet and rose and pink and blue, as if to greet the coming day, the morning glories held full sway. And as the warm June days drew nigh, a tiny rosebud caught my eye. And soon the roses, rich and rare, sent their sweet fragrance on the air. Then later came our little Sue, then Mary Jane, then little Bill, then little Ruth, who couldn't stay. She sleeps out yonder on the hill. We used to gather there each eve. We felt she'd like to have us near. But mother's sleeping with her now. I've been alone for nigh a year. I see it now, that fence so white, the morning glories all abloom, the babes we love to play in there, the roses in the month of June, and mother waiting by the gate to greet me at the close of day, to tell me all the pretty things that she had heard the babies say. 
Ah, yes, I see it all again. The yard all strewn with the baby toys, the swing beneath the maple tree, the dolls for girls, the carts for boys, the happy children there at play, the children now all gone away. Ah, yes, I guess that we must be content with life's sweet memories. I know we're getting pretty old. That fence in me, we've had our day. So just a little loving care to keep us happy while we stay. I'll patch it up and paint it white. I guess I'll make it look all right. Well, beautifully done, Chris. That poem apparently had a lot of meaning for your grandfather. And many of his poems deal with quests for gold in the Arctic and the Southwest. Did he actually go there? No, as far as I know, he never did. He never left Vermont, I think, except to go to the World's Fair. And uh, so, but he wrote, he was a big fan of Robert Service, who mm. wrote about quest for gold in the Arctic, like with the cremation of Sam McGee. And so he loved his rendition. Yeah, so. and I think that's where he got his inspiration. And that's the unfortunate part that I, he wasn't around after I realized the value of his poetry, so I could ask him what his inspiration was. Did he ever read those to you? He'd occasionally recite one. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you had to learn him uh, to perform this way, not by looking at a text, but memory, right? Remember, Memorization. And I think that's the whole key to this poetry as well as probably most poetry. And I don't think people realize it. When they say memorize by heart, where you take the words in, and then when they come back out, they bring the emotion with them, and it becomes like a performance. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what they did before TV and radio to entertain themselves. And the next poem that Chris is going to recite shows his love of the Arctic, and it has a surprise ending. Anything you want to say about it, Chris, and why you decided to do this one for us? Probably because it's one that concerns the Arctic was which a theme he often used, but only because it was the shortest one. Most of them run, some run for 15 minutes. So I picked this one because it was short. Uh huh. And with that introduction now, let's listen to Chris A. Bayer as he recites Arctic Love, a poem by his grandfather, George Albert Letty. There are many sons who could tell you tales whose dads have traveled the Arctic trails. I'll never forget the moon that night as it hung so low in the distant sky. A tired moon with a hungry light, an anemic thing and about to die. But it showed me the way that I had to go as it cast weird shadows on the snow. I'll never forget the way I felt when I said goodbye to the little shack. To the little shack where we lived and loved and I dreamed of the day we'd be coming back. But there are many things that we do not know. As you live your life, you will find it so. I'll never forget the night we met as she sang her songs in that Yukon Hall to that restless crowd who were cheering loud. They called her the little baby doll. Be she good or bad, I did not know and I did not care, for I loved her so. I'll never forget how she told me then, by her father's death, she was left alone. She had to sing, twas the only thing, twas the only world she had ever known. So I gave her my home, it was all I had, but she loved it there, and her heart was glad. I'll never forget how her laughter rang, rang through the hills and echoed back cheering me on as I worked my claim, making a heaven out of my shack. Silent now as I fought my way, only a bundle on the sleigh. I'll never forget how the huskies strained, fighting their way through the drifting snow, lashing them on with the stinging whip, faster and faster and yet too slow, praying to God in the distant sky, praying to God, don't let her die. I'll never forget how the miles behind had taken my strength. I was nearly through when I sighted the lights of a little town. I knew they were lights, that was all I knew. But they carried me in and they cared for me, 
as crazy a man as you'd ever see. I'll never forget when I opened my eyes. Twas a bright spring day and the skies were blue. The whitewashed wall and the sheeted bed in the crib in the corner and then I knew. And they showed me the grave in the churchyard lot and I prayed by the hour on the spot. I'll never forget the way I feel when I think of the shack that we called home, of the laughter and joy of a love so sweet. Oh God, I could never go back alone. I'm telling you this because my life's near done and she was your mother and you are my son. Nicely done, Chris. Uh, tell me, your grandfather must have spent a lot of time on these poems. Do you think writing came easy for him? Uh, I don't know. He, in his later years, we re remember him typing the manuscripts up in his room. You know, he was probably 67 years old. But he didn't punctuate it. And that's, that's what I brought to it, was a punctuation. So I don't know that he was writing so much as just recording what was in his memory. And how old were you when he passed away? I was 17. Well, that doesn't give you much time, because young boys don't think about poetry particularly. No. I know I didn't. No. So when did you get a first interest in it? And did you get a chance to really talk to him about it later on? Unfortunately not, you know. He was gone by the time I realized the value of the work, and that's the big regret I have. So you really didn't uh, get interested till he was gone. The manuscripts were kept by your mother, you said, right? Yes. And you knew they were there? Oh, yes. Yeah. When did you uh, go through them and, and read them and develop an interest in them? Well, 1985, I made photocopies of the manuscripts just to share with the family. Uh, and then I realized with the word processors that were becoming available on personal computers that I could make a book. Mm -hmm. But it took me to 1998 before I c completed the book and had it copyrighted. You had to do the uh, punctuation and read them out loud and find out where, what he meant by what he said and get the, the accent right. Uh, that, is that when you really got it? Exactly. That's when it happened. I said, wow. When you, know, you say some of those lines out loud and you can feel it and it says, wow. Well, you, you, you did a performance of two of them for us. Um, do you have any theatrical background? No, I haven't, and that's the thing. It just sort of came to me naturally, and that's where I think, well, maybe my grandfather is behind this, after all. And uh, where have you done performances with him? Well, I just finished first night where I did three shows, and there's so much material that I did three 40-minute shows, and I didn't duplicate too much of the material. So uh -huh. that's, that's a good venue for me to get it out locally. I've done some festivals, Fiddler's Festival, and uh, I, I perform for seniors at senior centers and coffee houses and things like that, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to grow it. Where do you go from here? Well, I'm enjoying doing it. So if I didn't go any further than this, I've had a, had a good run. But I think the material is so good that it should be shared with a broader audience and that's why I appreciate you having me on your show so that I can get the word out and try to grow this you know a grassroots Vermont way. So if groups out there are interested in you uh, reading poetry um, you're available. Oh, huh? Definitely. Well thank you very much for being with us today Chris Abair from Colchester and sharing with us the poetry of George Albert Letty and this is the book, and there's a, a website, is there not? Abear.com is our family website. Okay. Let me just run down. For more information, you can call Chris at 802-863-4030 or reach him at abear.com. That's 802-863-4030 or on the Internet at abear.com. We'll leave that information on the screen while I tell you tomorrow we have some very special recipes for Valentine's Day prepared by a chef who's well known, Stephen Schimoller of the Mist Grill in Waterbury, Vermont, and I hear that we're in for a real treat. So let's find out together uh, and join us for our special Valentine's Day show tomorrow right after the noontime news and weather.
Cross the Fence is presented as a public service by WCAX-TV, UVM Extension, and the Agricultural Experiment Station of the University of Vermont. Plan to join us every day, Monday through Friday at this time, for another visit across the fence. This program was recorded.